All right, I think I'm live. Here we go. All right, so let's dive in. So yeah, so I'm doing a live video today. I did not have a video to upload. Uh, I've been wanting to do kind of like the template videos every Wednesday, but those take a little extra time because uh, I got to write the actual samples. I got to figure out what exactly I want to share. And right now I've also got a piece I've been commissioned, a couple pieces I've been commissioned to write. So I've been spending a lot of time working on those. But I am excited to take a little bit of a break from all that and actually get back to work on this. So last we worked together, we had the entire sketch taken care of, a rough draft of our theme. I'm not going to play the whole thing at the moment just because I've heard it so many times, and I'm sure all of you have as well. Um, the next step is to make it sound more realistic. All right, try to make it sound a little more, a little more polished. What this is called is creating a an orchestral mock-up or a MIDI mock-up, trying to create as realistic a sound as we can. Now, I have a uh, Korg Nano Control Two, a little like fader thing, but it's so temperamental for whatever reason with my computer. And today is one of the days where it has decided it's just not going to work. So I think that kind of works for us, anyways. Because then you guys will see what I have a little more detail about what I have to do. But now at this point, I'm just kind of talking. I'm just talking at this point. So let's hit play. Let's listen to the intro. This is the first thing we're going to focus on making sound nice. All right. Pretty simple. All right, so the first thing we need to do is we need to make sure that all these instruments playing are balanced from a uh, channel volume sense. So that's a uh, CC controller number seven, for those of you who understand MIDI. Um, that is basically track volume. So CC number seven sets how loud is this track able to get. Then Within that, you have something called expression, which is CC number 11. And what that is, it's what percentage of your max volume are you at? So what we want to do is we want to go through here. We want to make sure that each of these instruments that are playing, it looks like we've got violins 2, violas 12, celli 12, basses, well, not 12. Those are the numbers of cellis. So we've got violins 2, violas, celli, basses, and it looks like tuba playing. So especially at the beginning I personally like to have things set up so that I've got a little wiggle room. I don't like to start right off the bat at the loudest I can be uh, because then you don't really have a lot of room to grow into. So let's add another track here. Create controller lane. We are going to shorten the articulation one. Let's take this middle one and we're going to turn it to CC7. Uh, MIDI control channel 7. Main volume. All right, we don't need to do anything crazy here. We just want to do a setting. We want to find a good setting. Um, all right, let's try about that. I wish. So what it's showing here is the actual MIDI volume. Let's actually see what we're working with here. So let's go to the tuba. Let's close that. So here we have our library. Uh, right now, because of what I just put, this is our CC7. It says it's about minus 10 decibels. As like a frame of reference, you could say that like zero decibels is around like the average, right? You want to stick to zero when you want to play basically the basic level of whatever you're playing. To go even heavier, you can go louder. To go quieter, you go quieter. And again, this is your max volume. So one good way to remember this is increasing something by one decibel is a subtle but noticeable difference. Increasing something by three decibels is a very, is a, it's a significant difference. And then increasing something by 10, it's doubling the original volume. All right, so let's go to the settings here. Let's go to controller. So right here, MIDI controller number seven, volume range. So basically this is saying for this slider, what's the top volume? The bottom is like minus infinity, but what's the top volume? The top volume it says right now is zero decibels. I'm gonna switch that to uh, 12. I like to have a little bit more work. Uh, to work with let's close that so we've got that set to 12 i wish let's actually see what we can do here so let's move this up to about i'd say about minus 
two around minus two ish is a good area to go let's see if we can just again this is where i wish i had my fader working all right let's make this smaller if i can there we go no it's not gonna let me all right so what is this this is like i said with the fader broken this is going to be real annoying very fast so 93 midi the max volume in midi is 127 so 93 that was a bit much way too much let's try cutting that down to 70. see where that puts us 75 actually let's try 75. all right and this as a heads up this is going to be pretty much par for the course um making an orchestrated sketch sound realistic is not all that glamorous all right hate to break it to you but it is very menial at times one, one minor, minor one minor one seven is probably good enough um it's, it can be very menial at times it can be very boring at times and each change you make is very very subtle so we've got cc controller at 73 let's listen to the tuba <laughs> Alright, and so you can hear the impact of it sounds like I did some modulation, possibly some expression. So let's see expression. No, nothing on expression yet. That's all right. That's good because we'll be doing that later together. Modulation, I've got some on modulation. But first, let's go through and make sure that each of our instruments playing are the same CC7, which again, we had it at, what is that, 81 it looks like? Oh my goodness, it's going to get so old not having my faders working today. 73, 73. All right, uh, Liminal, I posted your link on Reddit in music production. Thanks for the tutorials. Awesome, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. That's really what does a lot of help for this channel is sharing stuff. I really, thank you, Liminal. I really appreciate that. I appreciate you. All right, so, Tuba, and, oh yeah, and general uh, open invite as usual. Any questions, any comments, anything you'd like to ask, recommend, suggest, go for it all right especially in this video like i said with the mock-ups it can get very menial very quickly that's like the fifth time i've said that so i'm gonna stop saying it all right so next violin two let's open this up let's make sure that we're working with the same cc number we've got velocity let's switch this velocity real quick let's switch this to main volume let's go over here and we're going to just very simply 73 boom all right 73 what we're going to do is we're going to go back here. We're going to go back to our settings. We're going to make sure that the top volume is 12 so that it's all uniform. And let's listen to this. All right, so we've got... Those, we've got CC number seven uh, kind of synchronized there. Let's just quickly go through each of these remaining voices and do the exact same thing. Go to CC seven, which is the main volume for the track. We are going to put it to our level 73 that we found works well for us. I'm sorry, I thought my phone was supposed to be awesome. Sorry, that's actually from the writer that I'm currently working on a theme for. We'll have to get back to them after this. Let's see here. So violas. We were just at violas, weren't we? Violas. Let's. Yep. It looks like we were just at violas. Um, again, make sure that they're all at the same settings. Next, we're going to go to the celli. Open the celli. Again. So much fun, right? But it really is. It actually, like I'm being a little sarcastic there. It is menial doing all of this, but it is so much fun. When you start, when the pieces start to come together, you start to realize how much more realistic everything is starting to sound, how much better everything is starting to sound. And all right, bases are the last ones we're working with here real quick. Let's open this. Let's go to our CC7 to switch to 73. Swap that. Open this. Make sure it's at the 12. And let's listen to it very quickly to make sure everything 
sounds about evil. We want to make sure that all of them have approximately the same kind of level of presence or command at this moment. All right, awesome. So that's step one. All right, step one, make sure they all have comparable levels. They don't all have to be exactly the same, but comparable levels of MIDI controller seven or channel volume. Next, to make it sound even more realistic, we are going to start on another MIDI channel, which is MIDI channel 11, which is expression. So MIDI controller channel seven is the maximum volume that you're allowing your channel to go. The expression you can basically think of as what percentage of that max volume are we using? All right, so typically I like to start about one, the value, uh, value like 100 or 90 out of uh, 127. Because again, remember, uh, MIDI values start at 127 and then, or they go from zero to 127. So we're at 90 here. What you want to do with sustained pitches like this is you still want to make them dynamic. You want to have movement. No tuba player is going to hold a note just static and do nothing with it. Uh, what makes a sustained pitch sound expressive is manipulating volume, timbre, and pitch across time. You don't have to do all three at the same time, but one of the easiest to emulate in music, in digital sequencing, is that dynamic expressivity. So what we're going to do is we're going to start at the 90, we are going to locate, where is the top point? Where's the loudest we want this note to be? Like, all right, I'm so going to say just a little past the midway point. Let's say we're going to come up here and then come down here again. All right, let's use this tool to make it a little more gradual. Let's listen to it. Well, first let's solo the tuba. Do a little bit larger peak here. Oops, let's make sure that's the same spot. And again, this is something where it's really nice if you have a controller. It's just super nice. My controller is not working today for whatever reason. You know what? Actually, I'm going to change something. I'm going to make this a uh, two-measure phrase. So let's say we go up here. We'll go a little past. Then down here. Up here a little bit. Then back down. Up. And down. Let's listen to this real quick. We'll just make this one higher and then down real quick. All right. Have I bored everyone away? <laughs> like I said, this doing this kind of attention to detail, it's not the most exciting part of composing, but it is one of the most important. Right? You want to make sure that your performances sound real. All right, so now we've got this expression map. Remember, expression is the percentage of your max volume you're doing. Again, if you have an actual controller, it can be very, very useful. All right, if you don't, you can use it like this, what I'm doing. I probably will come back at a later date when my controller is working and come through here and redo this. But the last one we would do, actually, you know what? Why don't we take... Well, no, it's pretty close. The modulation signs are pretty close to each other. Modulation is the next one. Basically, the idea behind modulation is it is helping you to shift through different samples of your instrument. So we've got the actual volume being manipulated through both expression and 
uh, track volume at this point. And modulation, what it does is it actually goes through the various samples to help match the most accurate version of the instrument that you can. So what happens with almost every instrument is that when you are working with various volumes, the louder you perform a pitch, the more prominent the overtones of that pitch are, and it creates a brighter sound. The quieter you play the note, most of the time, um, the overtones become less prominent, and suddenly it becomes a mellower sound. And so most good sample libraries nowadays take this into account and provide something called modulation, which allows you to move between these various tone colors to create an expressive, realistic performance. Let's give this a quick listen. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to reduce this modulation a little bit because you heard this up here, I believe. You can hear a little bit of a growling sound as it plays that. So the tuba there is playing. They're using a sample from a tuba playing much louder than I want it to be playing right now. And what was that? Why didn't it all move? There we go. Just going to do it a little bit. Let's try that out. Hey, Staline Liminal, great to have you on. Awesome. And as always, like I said, this video in particular isn't going to be all that exciting. So feel free to shoot any questions, any comments, theories, suggestions, anything and everything. Shoot it my way. I am more than happy to talk since a lot of this stuff I can just do mindlessly as well. Um, and we're going to do that for each of them. Let's actually do something a little more exciting real quick. A little more exciting. We're going to make this ostinato sound a little more realistic. What happened to the tuba? Alright, so that's just weird. Alright, so let's take a look at this. So right now we've got we're gonna want to bring up the velocity. Right now, what we have done is we added a little no, we didn't really add much uh randomization to this. But what we've got is we've got each of the major notes that we want accented, accent. The other ones, not so much. So what we want to do here is to make this more realistic. What, right now we've got something called a, uh, a uh, machine gunning effect, where we've basically got the same sound coming over and over again. There's a couple things we can do here. We can add a little bit of randomness to the velocity, which is how hard the note is hit. We can add a little bit of randomness to the articulation point, which is exactly where the note is played in relationship to the downbeat. And kind of uh, the length between that it comes off at. So here I actually have some stuff pre-set up in the logic editor, if my computer will unfreeze. Uh, the logic editor is Cubase's randomizer. All right, every DAW has a randomizer. The logic controller, logic editor, whatever, yeah, logic editor, can be a little confusing and intimidating. I'm not going to pretend that I have a complete understanding of everything, but I have everything set up that I need to have set up, at least for now. And so, yeah, whatever DAW you work with, I recommend figuring out how to do your random setting because here we're going to get one of my presets. We're going to do velocity 6% variability. So this is a setup that I have each of these notes here from whatever velocity I have set them at, which we've already taken care of that. It is now going to apply a... Ooh, I have some notes that aren't selected is now going to take each of these and reassign them velocity randomly within 6% above or below the current level. So let's do the logic editor. We're going to start with that. Velocity 6% uh, variability. Apply it. And now we have a little more variability in our velocity. It has a subtle impact, but it makes it sound more realistic. Notice how there's no longer any straight lines across these velocity layers. You can see where the randomization stops because suddenly we get back to straight lines. And this is a lot more realistic because when the actual violin section is playing fast or rhythmic rolls, it's not going to be hitting every single note with the exact same level of force. Um, I was like, uh, okay, Stalin, how do I know where to do a realistic mock-up? Um, 
great question. There's a lot of really good information out there. Uh, some of it I learned in class. Some of it I learned from YouTube videos. I actually, oh, let's see if I have the book here. Oh, yeah. I have this book. This book right here is fantastic. It's a bit pricey. I will warn you ahead of time. Uh, it is pricey. It's called The Guide to MIDI Orchestration 4th Edition by Paul Gilreath. Um, it is also a little on the older side. As far as books on technology go, it's about 10 years old. Um, so some of the tech stuff is a little outdated. But the fundamentals are fantastic. It is the best manual I've ever seen for learning how to make each of your instruments and make them sound as realistic as possible. Um, so if you can afford it, I recommend checking out this book. If not... You can, and you're willing to wait, I do plan on doing another orchestration series. My old orchestration series is a bit dated. It was one from my earlier days on YouTube. I do want to update it, do a lot more awesome, really cool stuff with it. So, uh, so yeah, that uh, hopefully that answers your question. But thanks, yeah, keep it coming. So now we have changed the velocities. We've randomized them. We've made them sound a little more realistic. Let's go to the logic editor. We're going to do our next preset, which I have set up, which is... Um, start point variability to minus two to four ticks. So in Cubase, a tick is a very, very small fraction of a beat. So what it comes out to Cubase is about five ticks equal 1% of a beat. Now where this comes in real handy is for doing things like legato or doing things like this, where we want to randomize the actual articulation point. Because again, when you've got 16 violin players all playing the same part, they are not all going to be starting exactly at the very same time. There's going to be some variability in there somewhere. All right, so let's apply this. What this does is I have this one set up to either move it anywhere from each note. It's going to get moved anywhere from being two ticks before the beat it is currently at or up to four ticks after. So the articulation point, you know, we move it. It's always better to be a little late than too early. So... A little, couple things just shifted. Let's see how it sounds now. All right, so good enough, good enough. You get the idea. Now, where this is like, so again, it's a very, very subtle effect. I wouldn't blame you if you couldn't hear the difference. All right, it takes a little bit of practice. And that's really what realistic mock-ups are all about, is making a bunch of really small, very subtle effect changes until eventually they all kind of build on each other and sound significantly more realistic because a bunch of tiny, little, subtle impacts will have a huge impact when put together. The last thing we're going to do is my third preset I've created, which is cutoff variability, 2% variability. Again, this one's not as important for short rhythmic parts like this, but basically it's going to take the length of each note and change it by like 2%. I'm going to apply it anyway just because I like to be thorough, but again, with short staccato voicings like this, it's not going to have that big of an impact. All right, there we go. So from there, I'm basically going to go through the rest of our voices and I'm going to start just applying the expression and modulation that we were working with earlier. So like I said, at this point, you guys know what I'm doing. If you've been on here at least for a little bit, um, you know what the difference between expression and modulation is. Hopefully I explained that earlier. Let's do, let's open up modulation because this track actually has modulation data. We're going to open, create another controller lane. We're going to create expression. So what we're going to do here is we're going to start at about 100. We're going to increase it to about, to match that peak. Come back down. Again, increase the peak. Come back down up again just slightly back down we're just kind of trying to match the general shape of the modulation we did for this one already all right let's give this a listen all 
I am going to reduce this modulation just a little bit. Alright, so why all of a sudden is our Let's do this. Why, why is sudden is this all so super quiet? So look at this. It's at about 73. That's where it was. Did we have it at the proper? Ah, the dynamics are just super quiet for whatever reason. Let's change this. Let's make sure that the... Um, let's just remove this actually real quick. We're going to go... We're going to... Let's see here. I gotta keep remembering to talking. Sorry, like I said, this stage in the process for mockups is menial, but it requires a lot of attention. So, again, any more questions? Anybody got anything for me? Because if not, you're just gonna be stuck watching here, uh, watching me do little things like this over and over and over again. Let's reduce that. Any questions about uh, the last template video or either the last learn by listening video or the last anything? Say today, that's a good question. I actually, that's something I wanted to ask you guys. What kind of template video would you like to see next? I've got ideas for like scary films, action f kind of music, hero themes, villain themes, um, comedy music. What do you want to learn next for the next Hollywood cliche video? Let's do here. We got the CC7 is set. We'll switch this one to modulation. Let's see here. So modulation, we're going to... What do we want to do for modulation here? Again, this would be so much easier if I had my modulation wheel working, but it broke. Or at least it's not working at the moment. You know what? This actually isn't all that bad. We don't need too much modulation here. Let's just do expression. What we're going to do is we're going to... Oops, let's just do a straight line. Start at 100. Move down slowly. Just a little bit, nothing too crazy. Go a little higher. Move down. here all right the limit i've just been watching your melody tutorial sentence form and period oh sweet awesome yeah the melody series that was a fun one to work on um yeah i feel like it's something that a lot of people at least for me that's something i really started out struggling with was like how like what like how do you go about writing melodies and there are so many different books i read that would just make me so angry just the idea that the author would say, like, well, tune smithing is something you either can or can't do. Or, like, it's a talent you either have or don't have. It's like, no, it's not true. It's not true at all. Um, it's, I mean, yeah, some people are naturally, they have a proclivity for it, you could say. But everyone can learn to increase their ability to write melodies or get better at it. So the melody series was really kind of like a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, like a personal project that really, uh, I really enjoyed working on that. So I hope it's been helpful. Um, let's see. I've just been watching your melody. But, but interested in character sketches. Ah, character sketches. Yes, I love character sketches. I've actually, I am I just worked on one right now. I can actually show you guys that uh, if you'd like in a little bit. Let me finish this first section. Ready? All right, yeah. Notice how that expression is now bringing our ostinato to life. All right. Now, why are the bass lines not playing? There we go. So I'm going to do something that you're never supposed to do in a realistic mock-up. Never, 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 never. I'm going to copy and paste some modulation. All right. And again, like I said, I promise I'm going to go back. I'm going to fix all of this. 
once my mod wheel is fixed. I just need a new keyboard in general. I need a new keyboard. The Nano Control 2 that I've been using for all my modulation for a long time just isn't working very well anymore, unfortunately. I'd like to do something. I would love, love a complete control by Native Instruments. That is definitely one of my goals is to eventually be able to afford one of those. Let's see here. Um, did I put that in the right one? I need express uh, modulation. There we go. Yes, I did. Um, here we go. One second. This sounds a little too quiet. All right. Why does the chili sound so quiet? You know what? It's because I got modulation there. Let's increase the modulation for this one. Because that'll add some variation. But yeah, once I have my controllers back, I'll be able to go back and fix this and change it. Let's take our expression. Um, my question is, does modern music use those forms? Oh, of course. Uh, so especially forms like the period binary form, these are still very, very common, especially in what kind of genres. Pop music uses the period. Um, concert music uses the period. Binary form is super popular. Film music uses it. Um, with film... like. Form is still very important, and the forms that are taught to this day are still, unless like you're doing sonata form or like rondo form or something a little dated, um, they all still have a place, and you can use whatever forms you want. Um, I talk about something called like a musical paragraph kind of approach in the Melody series, and that's a bit more on the nose for what you might find in film music these days. And here we got to add some variation here um, is because a lot with film music. I'm actually reading a fantastic book right now. It's on my chair over there called Hollywood Harmony by Frank Lehman. Uh, fantastic. Ridiculously academic. I mean, I, I, I'm used to write, reading academic stuff, but that's a lot more academic than I was expecting. And like it's really big words really kind of like unnecessarily long sentences and ideas. So it is difficult to read. I find myself having to reread paragraphs at times, but it is fantastic. And the whole reason why I brought him up is uh, he brings up this concept that when you're working with form in film music these days, you cannot divorce it from the story. Film music does not exist for its own sake. It does not exist on its own. By very definition, it requires the film to exist. Film music is written in service to the form, film. And with that in mind, you will always get your form from the film. There we go. There we've added some change there. So there are different things like that that you'll be able to uh, pick up on form-wise. But things like, I'd say the two forms I use the most frequently are binary form and the period. All right, the musical period. I use those very frequently. In fact, those are kind of my defaults. When I'm sketching out a theme, I'll go for one of those. In fact, the if I have time, if, if you remind me later, I'll show you a sketch I'm working on currently for a character, uh, for a playwright, and um, it's for a scene in a one act play uh, where they need some piano music that the character is playing. And I use binary form for that, or at least a loose interpretation of binary form. All right, so we added the velocity variability. Let's add start point variability and cutoff variability. There we go. Make this cello performance a little more realistic. Why, why does everything stop? I wonder if I got like a weird setting or something on it. Where it just like cuts out everything except for the one that's highlighted. That's gotta be it. I've got some kind of setting on. That's not like, wait, one second. Let me see up here. There we go. <laughs> that's actually really cool. I didn't know I could do that in Cubase. All right, that's awesome. All right, I really think, wow. Look at that. That is the more you know, the more you learn. All right, so now let's do a little bit of, let's highlight this. 
and we're basically going to once again copy and paste to the violas until I can get better controllers. All right. Yeah, I hope that answers your question, Liminal. Um, that yes, modern music does use forms. It's a matter of your own personal taste, though. I'd say if you find a form you like, work with it. Uh, the way I like to work with projects, especially like film scoring, is I will sketch out my themes beforehand. So before I even try to make it fit to a scene, I'll create like a sketchbook where I'll, have, I'll know what important themes and motifs I need to write. I'll write those ideas out. And for that, I'll use different forms that I find very helpful. And then once I have the basic idea of like, this is my theme I've written for this character, then I can go through different scenes and like uh, rearrange it, add variation, change things up a bit to make it um, work for each given scene and use. All right, there we go. We got that. And actually, that's something where I've got a series, a short series on film scoring. It wasn't the most popular thing. There's a couple series that I cut short just because they weren't, they weren't getting a good reaction. The two that hurt the most to cut early were the Melody series. I did end up cutting that one early. I had a lot of different ideas that I wanted to include, but I just didn't. Like I said, it wasn't, it wasn't getting attention. Uh, and the film scoring series were. I went through the actual like tools and everything that you need to actually professionally approach film scoring as its own work and job. Um, let me see here. Then we had modulation. So yeah, that one did hurt. Both of those hurt quite a bit to stop early, but um, you gotta go where people uh where like people want me to go with my stuff. So let's see here. Because I make my money by advertisements and people watching the ads. And I'm not going to make any revenue if people aren't watching the videos. Let's see here. And with that... All right, and then we've got a little more realistic performance of each of these parts. Now, this is, like I said, pretty much a pretty dull and relentless part. I've shown most of the important parts. So I think I'm going to do the rest of this by myself off camera so that I don't end up having several hours or several weeks worth of live feeds of just kind of this. So a couple things I will go through just to explain kind of the ideas. Instruments like this in particular with the brass, I'm going to go through and make sure each of these instruments has its own track. All right, instead of putting two trombones in one solo trombone track, I'm going to give them each their own track. That way the differences in modulation, differences in expression, the different uses of each track can make it sound a little more realistic. Because again, when you have two trombone players, they're not playing the exact same volume and the exact same attack points and everything for all of that. So I'll do that for each brass instrument in particular. I'll give them each their own. The one exception is the horns playing in unison. Since these are all playing in unison, I'll just kind of leave them this way. You can kind of cheat that way. A lot of the, a lot of the sound libraries are designed with that in mind. It's mostly when they're playing separate ideas that you want to give them their own track. Um and. Other than that, yeah, so I think this time I'm going to go through, I'll make the rest of this sound realistic in and of itself uh, using these techniques that I just showed you. Then once all of it is handled and treated that way, as you can see where the violin stopped with all the MIDI data that we were entering to make it sound more realistic. In fact, actually, this is this will be nice. It'll be able to see a little bit of a difference between these two. All right, and we'll play this in a second. But we'll have... Uh, once it's all made mocked up a bit better, when we come back, we'll add the percussion together. And then once the percussion is added and made a little more realistic, once all of that's together, then we'll start mixing it. All right. And there's a couple changes I might make here or there to, uh, to help smooth out transitions between sections. But real quick, I want you guys to listen to the difference between the ostinati, the ostinato that we've added all this stuff to and the ostinato that we haven't. So we'll listen. All right, here it's a very, very subtle effect. Let's actually come back here. We're going to go from 
will loop back. You'll notice that the expression is going to change quite a bit. All right, so again, very subtle impact. But again, if you're having every single track on here and you're adding subtle impacts to them, it all layers quite a bit and creates a much more realistic sound. All right, let's see here again. Let's see here. Uh, Liminal, another question. Um, I've watched most of your videos. I'll check it again. They are awesome. I just finished a course on film composing by Jason Allen as well. Awesome. Great. Uh, cannot say I've ever heard of Jason Allen. Uh, I'll have to check out uh, the course though. That sounds awesome. I'm always looking to just see what other people have to teach, other things that they find important, things like that. So, but I'm really, really excited and grateful that you find it useful. Um, so you got a little look at what kind of work goes into making a sketch sound more realistic. Like I said, a lot of it's very repetitive. A lot of it is very menial, but it is so, so, so very important. So I'll stay on for a couple more minutes. We'll chat. All right. If anyone's got any questions, anything like that, I can show you guys a sketch of something I'm working on. Let's see here. It's just a fun. It's all activate. We'll try this out. All right. So for this project I'm working on, I've got like one minute for this particular scene. I've got like one minute of music that I needed to write. The character is playing piano. They've, I don't want to, I, I, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say. So I'm not going to give too much. Just know that like the, the whole point is like, they're trying to cope with some really bad news and they're struggling with it. So they sit down to play piano for a little bit. And then at the end, they just kind of fall apart. So there's a bit cluster at the end. This is just a sketch. So I haven't gone through to make sure everything sounds exactly the way I want it to. But I figured it's fun. It gives me some time to uh, do something and stay on with you guys a little bit longer. Let me minimize that. And you can just kind of listen to something new that I'm working on that I haven't shared with you guys yet. little piano idea that I've been working on for like I said a one act play I got commissioned to write for and I'm having fun with it it's my first time writing a piece like that so I thought I'd share it. it's something to do to kill a little bit of time um but yeah all right I'll stay on for a little bit longer any questions any comments any concerns theories suggestions anything I'll stay on for I'd say like five more minutes and I'll just kind of rant and talk about stuff until I get questions. If I don't get any questions within five minutes, we'll just call it in. No problem. All right. So let's see. What do I want to talk about? Um, hmm. Uh, I got to keep working on this piece. I got to make it sound a lot more realistic. But uh, that's not what we're here to talk about. All right. So book suggestions. What about book suggestions? I can do that. Um, oh, awesome. I've got. Let me take this off real quick. One of my favorite books on harmony. Actually, this is one that uh, anytime I, I a lot of the time I have students who, when they start with me, they'll ask, "Hey, what books do you recommend?" And so this is actually one of the books I recommend quite frequently, uh, and it ends up kind of being almost a bit of like a textbook uh, at times, where we'll go through different chapters together. I'll explain the concepts to uh, with them. We'll apply it to other things that we discuss. But it is called Reharmonization Techniques by Randy Felt. It's from the Berkeley Press. Fantastic, fantastic book. Um, a lot of great strategies here for taking chord progressions 
and rehumanizing them. So, uh, uh, oh, oh, what kind of character was it for? Oh, this? Uh, this, like I said, this was written for a... So the character that this was written for, it's not their actual theme. It's something It's something called diegetic music, meaning it's music that's within the play itself. It's within the world of the story. So at one point, we have a character who sits down and just starts playing at the piano. They're feeling a little overwhelmed. They're trying to calm down. And so they start with something. So I started with something simple, something a little sad. I used the uh, emotion tool that I have in my book and that I have a video on YouTube about. Check it out. To try and make sure that I could portray everything as I go. So... As I went on, a couple different things that I did here. The first is I started with this little melody. All right, this melody, it's a pretty typical sad melody. All right, pretty simple sad melody. What I did is I added something called a lamenting bass line. The lamenting bass line is a very, very, very old concept. Back to the early days of uh, almost kind of Gregorian chant. I think it was a little later than Gregorian chant. But it's the idea where you go with the tonic of a natural minor. And you just move down by step until you reach the fifth. And then you just repeat. So I knew that as this piece went on, I wanted to make it sound darker. And I wanted to build the anxiety a bit, kind of portray that the, what the character is trying to keep down. So to make it darker, my key strategy was moving lower and lower and lower into the piano's range. All right, the lower the registers I worked with, the darker it becomes. To create a bit more of the anxiety, I switched to much quicker rhythmic subdivisions. All right, and so as you hear the piece until eventually you get to this part here where it's a new theme, again, binary theme, uh, bi uh, binary form. So what we have is an eight bar phrase that gets repeated twice and then a new theme that gets repeated, well, not entirely twice, but out there. So then we get to this part where it's just kind of going crazy with all the different rhythms. <laughs> Yep, and so it just kind of gets a little more complicated, a little more rhythmically active, and a little bit wider in the number of ranges to try and portray some of that anxiety that the character is experiencing while they're trying to keep their mind distracted by playing piano. Until at the very end, in the script, it says that they just they kind of start crying, just like you know, put their head down on the keyboard. So right now, I just did a quick cluster. At the end, like I said, this was just a sketch. This was a proof of concept that I sent to the uh, writer slash director so that they're going to check it out. They're going to give me feedback on whether or not they like it. And if they like it, then I'll go through and I'll finish the arrangement. I'll make it sound nice and polished. And then later on in the play, I have to rearrange this for a larger uh, arrangement. I have to do something like uh, I get to use organ. I get to use the pipe organ. It specifically says pipe organ in the uh, script. So I'm super excited for that because I have a pipe organ um, sound library that I never get to use. No, that's harp. And so I've been doing a lot of studying on how to actually write for organ, how to make sure that it's idiomatic, how to make sure that it sounds right. Uh, but I'm super excited for this. Uh, what kind of character? Uh, book I've been reading, Elements of Musical Composition by William Crotch, Berriman Rainbow, old book. Awesome. I'll check it out. Thanks for the recommendation. But... Uh, Ooh, that's a little high still. Uh, change that. I'm super excited just to be able to finally work with like an organ again. At this point, though, I'm kind of ranting. It's been a little bit. Uh, we did what we expected to do in this kind of thing. If there are uh, in this video, if there are no other questions, like I said, next time we meet, I'll have redone the entire mock-up. I showed the basic tools and strategies that you use to take a sketch and make it sound more realistic. The next time we meet, we'll have a working functional sketch or mock-up, no longer a sketch. We'll add the percussion together. You'll see my process for that. We'll make that sound more realistic. And then, yeah, from there it goes on to mixing and mastering. Oh, hi, quick tips on writing the basics of a motor rhythm or ostinato. Awesome, actually great, I'm super glad you asked. This is something I've actually done in previous videos. 
Uh, I actually think I have a whole video on writing ostinati. But, so, a couple steps I would say. Very first step is to figure out what kind of ostinato you want to write. Is it going to be rhythmic, which is just a quick, rapid, repeating rhythm? Do you want it to be harmonic, uh, which means it actually moves from different pitches while doing the rhythm? Or melodic, which it moves to different pitches and they don't have to be from the underlying chords. Um, figure that out. What kind of articulations do you want to use? Short, long, combination of both. Figure out where you want it to be in relationship to your foreground material, if it's not in the foreground. So do you want it to be higher in pitch, lower in pitch? Um, then the last thing you want to consider is you want to complement the already occurring stresses in your melody. Like if your melody has strong beats, strong notes, do you want the ostinato to share strong notes at that same time to complement it and make it stronger and more cohesive? Or do you want it to contrast by having different stress points and make it sound a little more syncopated? Um, that was a really uh, kind of abbreviated approach, but I do have a full video that goes much, much more in detail on that. Uh, so I'd recommend checking that out for actual examples, a lot more detail, uh, or like definitions, uh, and then like an entire, uh, I think, a demo of using that process from scratch. Uh, of course, not a problem. Here, if you are writing this down, I'll write it down with you. Notepad. All right. Open my notepad. All right. Writing ostinati. All right. Step one. What kind? Rhythmic, which means it's just one pitch being repeated at a rhythm. Uh, harmonic, which it has the rhythm, but it's going to move through different pitches, namely ones that stick to the underlying harmony. So only chordal tones or melodic. Which is like the harmonic, it moves to different pitches, but you don't need to stay within the harmony. Namely, you can use things like passing tones, uh, neighbor tones, things like that to give it a little more personality. So step two is consider what kind of articulation you want. You should, so is it going to be short, long, combo? Basically, like what kind of personality do you want your performance to have? Uh, step three, where in relationship to the... Uh, melody. So do you want it to be higher in pitch, lower? Uh, step four is uh, where do you want to... Uh, let me see, because I'm a little out of order here, but it's all right. They, you just kind of figure this stuff out and then you start writing. Uh, you don't need to follow a strict order, but step four is... So we've got the... What type? What kind of articulations? What relations, what, what, so uh, is it contrasting or complementary? stress points so basically where are the strong notes in your melody all right where do they occur rhythmically on beat one beat three is it syncopated so it's on the end of beat one wherever it is where are the strong accented notes in your melody do you want your ostinato to have them have its strong notes at the same time or do you want it to be elsewhere to add contrast the general rule is if it has the same stress points it creates a more cohesive and structurally sound uh, atmosphere of personality. If they are contrasting, it creates a lot more kind of tension and a little a little more kind of crazier energy to it, a little more syncopated. And then step five is write the ostinato, layer it with the melody only, and then gradually add other layers until you have the sound you want. Like I said, this is my own approach that I came up with. It's worked really well for me. Um, I've got a full video on it on the YouTube channel that you can check out. Uh, let's see here. Writing basics. So like starting points. I'm writing this down. Awesome. All right. So if that is the last question, I mean, we got five minutes left until the hour. I'll stay on a little bit longer. Um, so shoot me any questions, stuff like that. I love helping with that. Uh, quick answers. Things about harmony. Things about techniques. Stuff like that. It's pretty quick for me, all right? Um, quick fixes like that are, I love it, all right? It's fun. Something I do in my uh, private lessons with my students is uh, every lesson I provide a lesson plan, which includes everything that I had planned out ahead of time of teaching, as well as notes and explanations of every single concept we go through. Um, so I always encourage my students to take their own uh, own notes but at the end 
you always get uh, they always get uh, notes that I took ahead of time on everything that they can reference, everything that I think is important for them to have taken notes on, as well as a recording of our actual lesson because the lessons happen on Zoom. Uh, all right, awesome. Uh, bye guys. We'll watch more vids. Awesome. Thank you, Liminal. On that note, I think uh, we're gonna take off. All right. Have a great one. Thank you, everyone, who came out of the video. I hope you learned something. I hope it was useful. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. Until next time, okay, keep studying, keep working hard, keep writing new music. I will see you all in the next video. All right, have a good one. And end.